It's sometime in the distant future, and a race of sentient robots is engaged in a war for control of their home planet. A surprise attack decimates the heroic side that now has to crawl its way back from the brink of total destruction. Along the way, leadership and loyalty are tested, and alliances are formed. The pursuit of peace and freedom is the ultimate goal. But like with any established movement, the torch must be passed to a new generation to continue this pursuit of freedom long after its founders are gone. I'm Jamie Logie, and this is Everything 80s, a podcast that looks back on a decade that forever changed the way we dress, consume, and connect it. And today we look back at the movie that's been called The Great Toy Massacre of 1986 and a lesson in how toy executives completely underestimated an audience's devotion to a product and character. This is the story of The Transformers, the movie. have a previous episode all about the full history of the Transformers in my earlier episodes, but here's the quick story. The Transformers began in Japan as the Diaclone toy line. Launched by Takara Toys in the early 80s, that first toy line featured transforming toys that Hasbro would relaunch and rebrand in North America. Hasbro bought the rights but expanded the universe of the toys. Hasbro gave the toys names like Optimus Prime, Soundwave, and Megatron. That early Diaclone line also included the familiar Dinobots and Insecticons. But most importantly now, the toys had a backstory. The Transformers come from a planet called Cybertron and are split into two factions, the evil Decepticons and the heroic Autobots. This backstory was partly created by comic book giant Marvel, which also gave specific character identities to each of the toys. The packaging for each toy would include the character-specific information on the back. Then, to fully launch the toy line in North America, a cartoon miniseries was commissioned. The miniseries gave us more information about the backstory and that the Transformers had to leave their home planet in search of other energy sources. They end up crash landing on Earth, where they lay dormant for millions of years until a volcano awakens them from their slumber. The cartoon was not only a great thing to eventually watch after school, but introduced us to all the characters we would soon see on store shelves. And... This backstory is key. A transforming robot is cool and all, but a kid can become much more invested when they learn that a heroic Autobot is a robotic alien race from a metallic planet under the attack from the evil Decepticons. The three-part miniseries co-produced between Marvel and Sunbow Productions launched in September 1984 and was immediately a huge hit with kids, myself included. Hasbro must have been pretty convinced that this extended pilot would be a success as another 13 episodes were commissioned before the miniseries pilot even aired. For the second season, a whopping 49 new episodes were created. Why such an arbitrary number? Well, if you take those 49 episodes, plus the 13 from the first season, plus the three episodes from the pilot, that equals... Check's calculator, 65 episodes, the minimum to qualify for syndication status. Now, Transformers could be aired on weekdays and in the highly desirable after-school time slot. And what we were watching wasn't much more than a 22-minute commercial to introduce us to the world and characters we now saw on toy shelves. With 49 episodes in the second season, there was much more opportunity to expand the Transformers universe. And with so many shows, individual characters could get their own episode, which was a perfect showcase to introduce that new character. Now, Hasbro had a character-specific commercial spotlight for subsequent toy releases. 
Combined with a show like G.I. Joe in the after school time slot, you had the perfect one two punch of story driven toy marketing. But after two seasons, with so many episodes, characters, and toys, there seemed to be an abundance of inventory, both creatively and on store shelves. The toy shelves of the 1980s were getting incredibly competitive, and with only so many spots on those shelves, many of the same characters from Transformers had been around for years now. By this point, if you didn't already have Soundwave, it probably wasn't going to happen. I'm still waiting to get my sound wave, by the way. Those toys that were now already a few years old were just taking up valuable shelf space. For Hasbro, how do you clear out the old inventory, bring in a fresh new line, expand the scope of the Transformers universe, and do it all in one shot before a third season? Maybe a movie. And that was the entire intent behind the Transformers The Movie to introduce the 1986 toy line. And that meant clearing out the 1985 line. So that seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? That possibly couldn't have any negative implications. But if a new toy line based movie is the goal, you still want to make something somewhat creative and unique. The very talented writers of the Transformers the movie were tasked with having to balance swapping out inventory while at the same time expanding the lore of the franchise, while still creating something entertaining. And here's what that all looked like with a quick plot recap. Hold on tight. The most incredible rock and roll adventure ever is here. Feed him to the shark gun. Starring Judd Nelson as Hot Rod. Leonard Nimoy as Galvatron. And Orson Welles. I am the the Transformers The Movie opens with the mechanical world-eating planet called Unicron as we see another planet devoured by this monstrous entity. One ship containing a passenger called Kranix is able to escape. Next, we find ourselves in the then very futuristic sounding year of 2005. The war between the Autobots and Decepticons has ratcheted up with the evil Decepticons conquering their home world of Cybertron. The Autobots need energy and a transport is sent to Autobot City on Earth. The Decepticons intercept the shuttle and kill most of the Autobots on board. The Decepticons then engage in a sneak attack on Autobot City. This ends up in the death of even more Autobots. Hmm, this seems a bit more violent than what we were watching after school. We'll get back to this in a bit. The Autobots on Earth send a distress signal back to Cybertron for reinforcements. The reinforcements include the Autobot leader Optimus Prime, who sends in the Dinobots and Devastator to combat the Decepticons. This battle culminates in a showdown between Optimus Prime and Megatron, the leader of the Decepticons. Both are wounded, and it ends up with the 37-year-old spoiler warning coming, the death of Optimus Prime. And we'll obviously also get back to this in a bit. Before Prime dies, he hands off his life essence, called the Matrix of Leadership, to Ultra Magnus. The Decepticons leave, and Starscream throws the wounded Megatron into deep space and assumes command. Megatron is pulled toward Unicron, who will rebuild him and his troops if he destroys the Matrix of Leadership, which has the ability to destroy Unicron. Megatron agrees and re-emerges as Galvatron, while some of the other troops, like Skywarp and Thundercracker, are cloned into new forms. When Galvatron reaches Cybertron, he sees Starscream about to be crowned leader of the Decepticons, but Galvatron blasts him away reclaiming his rightful role. Unicron devours two of Cybertron's moons while Galvatron leads another attack on Autobot City. Ultra Magnus leads the Decepticons away but ends up crashing on the planet of junk. Another group of Autobots, including the character Hot Rod, are imprisoned on another world but are rescued by the Dinobots. Galvatron has tracked down Ultra Magnus and takes the Matrix, planning to use it on Unicron. Hot Rod and the others arrive, rebuild Ultra Magnus and take off to confront Galvatron and Unicron and get back the Matrix. 
Galvatron threatens Unicron with the Matrix, but is unable to open it. Unicron transforms from a planet into a giant robot and attacks Cybertron and swallows Galvatron. Hot Rod then flies the ship through one of Unicron's eyes, and while inside, Hot Rod encounters both Galvatron and the Matrix. During a battle, Hot Rod grabs the Matrix, and it opens. As he hears the voice of Optimus Prime, Hot Rod is transformed into Rodimus Prime and becomes the new leader of the Autobots. Galvatron is defeated, and Unicron is blown up. The Great War is over, and a new age of peace begins. Despite creative limitations, the Transformers, the movie, was a remarkable spectacle, and the characters were brought to life through a true all-star cast that performed the voices. This might be one of the best assembled voice casts of all time. Two of the mainstays are Peter Cullen as Optimus Prime and voice of the 1980s Frank Welker as Megatron, Soundwave, Wheelie, Frenzy, Rumble, and Junkion. John Mashita Jr. is the voice of Blur, and you may remember him as the fast talker from the Micro Machines commercials. Judd Nelson, a.k.a. Bender from The Breakfast Club, provides the voice of Hot Rod and Rodimus Prime. Ultra Magnus is voiced by Robert Stack, who you probably remember from the show that also scarred a generation of kids, Unsolved Mysteries. The voice of Cup was performed by Lionel Stander, whose work goes back to the silent era of film. He was also in the original A Star is Born from 1937. The great Casey Kasem from American Top 40 is the voice of Cliff Jumper. Don Messick, who is the voice of Scooby Doo, Bam Bam from the Flintstones, and Astro from the Jetsons, was the voice of Scavenger and Gears. Leonard Nimoy is the voice of Galvatron. Eric Idle from Monty Python is Rekgar. And last but not least is Scatman Crothers, aka Dick Halloran from The Shining, as the voice of Jazz and the legendary iconic Orson Welles as the voice of Unicron. The role of Unicron in Transformers the movie is considered Welles' last true performance before his death in October 1985. Welles passed away not long after recording his lines and before the movie was even released. It's kind of interesting that back in 1938, the career of Orson Welles was launched to true superstardom with his radio performance of an alien invasion in War of the Worlds. And his last role was in a movie about an alien species from outer space. As a kid, I was completely unaware of the true intention of the Transformers, the movie. But ultimately, this film existed as a sort of theatrical spring cleaning of the characters and previous toy line. And this made it difficult to put together. In the documentary, Till All Are One, the writers express how they had to continually rewrite this movie as they learned which characters were coming in and which were being discontinued. The movie might be heading in a specific direction, but Hasbro could introduce a new product that would alter the trajectory of the original draft. Transformers, the movie, was trying to find that blend between commercialism and creativity, something that's always been at the cornerstone of this franchise. Because there are several companies involved, there have always been a lot of moving parts when it comes to Transformers. You have Takara, the original toy company that created them, Marvel on the creative and storytelling end, Sunbow Productions producing the cartoon, the toy animation company actually making it, and Hasbro manufacturing and selling the toys. All of them have had to always work together and many interests needed to be served. Throughout this whole process, from toy to cartoon to movie, there was never a Kevin Feige that oversaw everything the way he has with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Many spoons entered the Transformers pot, all trying to stir it in the same direction. And the Transformers movie was no different. But the goal of all of this, whether it's a cartoon or movie, was to move merchandise. Everyone involved had to be seamlessly interwoven 
with the goal of creating content to sell as many toys as possible. And this is why the movie made a lot of sense. Transformers had conquered the small screen, but with a movie and a gap between seasons two and three, they got the chance to sell tickets and then advertise in front of kids for basically 90 straight minutes. But the one constant throughout this entire creative process was out with the old, in with the new. But that doesn't mean they created something bland and lackluster. Transformers the movie really is a remarkable production. The animation created by Toei Animation is pretty astounding, especially when seen on a modern Blu-ray or 4K presentation. The animators were allowed to be more artistic than what was created with the TV series. Whereas the cartoon show was drawn with simple lines and designs, Transformers the movie featured much more detailed animation, color, shading, lighting, and shadows. And everything you saw on the big screen was created from scratch. The characters, the ships, the backgrounds, nothing was recycled from the cartoon show. The Transformers the movie is incredibly artistic, and they had the budget to do so. Nearly $6 million was spent to produce this film, or around $17 million in today's money. That was six times more than it cost to create the equivalent time length of the regular cartoon series. The music in this movie does really date it, but gives it a distinctive 1980s feel. There is a lot of arena rock and heavy guitars. The movie even features the song Dare to be Stupid by Weird Al Yankovic. There is the defining song The Touch by Stan Bush, a song originally meant to be in the Sylvester Stallone movie Cobra. My favorite piece of music from this movie is the hard rock version of the original Transformers TV theme song performed by glam metal band Lion. I think every kid in theaters across the country was ready to run through a wall the first time they heard that. Despite being a 90-minute commercial, the creators of the movie still tried to explore themes of perseverance, loyalty, determination, and believing in yourself. This is a movie about courage. To quote Stan Bush from the song The Touch, you never bend, you never break. You seem to know just what it takes. You're a fighter, you've got the touch, you've got the power. Everything seemed to be set up for this movie to be a box office success. It was Transformers on the big screen after all. It couldn't miss, could it? What could possibly go wrong? As usual, those are some pretty famous last words. Everything 80s will return after these messages. The Transformers the movie was released in August of 1986, and it really didn't make a splash, opening in 14th place. What was the problem? One of the big issues right away was the Transformers movie had a ton of competition. If you remember back to the summer of 1986, you'll know it was a stellar one for movies. Just some of the movies that were out by August that year were Flight of the Navigator, Howard the Duck, that no one knew was a train wreck yet, The Fly, Stand By Me, The Parent Trap 2, Aliens, Armed and Dangerous, and Big Trouble in Little China. Also coming out not long after Transformers was released was the second biggest hit of 1986, Crocodile Dundee. And... This doesn't include movies that came out earlier in the summer, but were still going strong in theaters, like the biggest movie of 1986, Top Gun. There was also The Karate Kid Part 2, The Money Pit, Space Camp, Back to School, Labyrinth, Short Circuit, and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Add this all up and you've got one of the biggest and best summers in movie history. Not only were there a bunch of big family movies available that summer, but the other blockbuster hits just meant there weren't that many screens available. Transformers opened on less than a thousand screens. By the fourth week, it was only around 600. 
But there was another big problem. Word that this movie was quite violent started to spread, and that put off many parents from taking younger children. Older kids loved it, but it was also rated PG, which further solidified that this wasn't necessarily a family or G-rated movie. I distinctly remember this being a concern with my own mother. Not to mention the fact the movie also allegedly contained some swearing. Children were clearly the intended audience, but this PG rating was used to try and draw in more teenagers. Also, PG movies got more screenings than G-rated ones. A big problem for many families was why make the trip to the theater and pay money for something that was on TV every day for free? Lastly, not that it should matter for what is still a kid's film, but critics absolutely hated it. By the end of its run, the Transformers the movie brought in around $5.7 million not even breaking even. But the biggest issue was how this movie crushed and horrified legions of kids. The jarring death of not only Optimus Prime, which happens barely 20 minutes into this film, but the death of many other beloved characters shocked an entire generation of kids. This whole movie was a shock to the senses. When all the dust settled, Major characters like Ironhide, Ratchet, Prowl, Brawn, Wheeljack, Windcharger, Megatron, Starscream, Starwarp, Thundercracker, Shrapnel, Kickback, and Bombshell were all dead. Sorry, discontinued. It was like the cartoon equivalent of the Game of Thrones Red Wedding, but with more engine coolant. In 1980s cartoon shows, despite how violent they may be, no one ever died. This movie was a massacre. At the end of the movie, the final death count was about 70, and kids weren't going to take it. The lackluster box office results were one thing, but an intense backlash to the movie soon followed. Even though they were fictional cartoons, when you watch something every single day after school, you tend to get attached to them. For a generation of kids, watching their favorite characters getting blown away on screen was incredibly jarring. Various early scripts had even more violence. In one early draft, all the Autobot characters from the 1985 toy line were going to charge the Decepticons only to get completely obliterated in one fell swoop. Fortunately, we were spared from that massacre. But the ultimate death blow was indeed the death blow to the beloved Optimus Prime. How can you kill off the leader, an ultimate good guy? Optimus Prime wasn't just the leader, he was the heartbeat and life force of the Autobots. The writers and producers of the movie completely underestimated the loyalty that kids everywhere had to these characters, especially to Optimus Prime. If you grew up with this movie, I don't need to explain it to you, but the thing that made it so jarring was that it wasn't just a quick death scene in the line of battle. Optimus Prime dies slowly in front of all his friends. This was partly based on John Wayne's death in the movie The Alamo. But we didn't know that. All we knew is our hero just died a slow and painful death. From the writer's perspective, since they were clearing out the old toy line, it seemed appropriate to give them a fitting send-off. Again, the executives completely underestimated the reaction of millions of kids. Some of the voice actors who had been playing these characters for years couldn't believe they were getting killed off. Peter Cullen, the voice of Optimus Prime, said he hated the decision to kill off the character he had been voicing for two years. Even one of the main writers, Ron Friedman, protested against the massacre, specifically the killing of Optimus Prime. This, though, is how the matrix of leadership came to be. It was a way to carry on the spirit of Optimus Prime that so many kids were familiar with and had now been watching daily for years. With Fallout coming from all angles, Hasbro now had to deal with something they never anticipated damage control. 
The higher ups involved with Transformers were shockingly unaware of how iconic Optimus Prime was. But this may have been because of how fast kids pop culture was moving in the 80s. For executives, their concern was product creation, marketing, sales, and competing with a tidal wave of other toy and cartoon creations saturating TV and toy shelves. It's easy to forget there's a little kid sitting in front of the TV heavily invested in their creation. And now, kids were crying in theaters and asking to leave. There were stories of kids locking themselves in closets and hiding under beds because they were so upset. The bad word about this movie was really starting to spread. And it was spreading in the most influential space of all. The internet and social media of the 80s, school playgrounds. From a commercial aspect, there was also an onslaught of new characters in the film that didn't resonate with kids. I mentioned earlier how in the second season of the cartoon show, with nearly 50 episodes, it allowed for individual character introductions. Entire episodes were used to flesh out who the character was and get viewers invested. That just wasn't possible with a movie. And as it turned out, Kids didn't exactly rush to the toy shelves after seeing the movie looking for the new characters. Hasbro was aware of the extreme negative reaction to this film, as all the backlash could have potentially sunk the entire brand. Hasbro was also aware of the massive letter-writing campaign from kids bewildered and upset at the death of their hero. This forced them to resurrect Optimus Prime in Season 3 of the cartoon series. In February 1987, a two-part episode entitled The Return of Optimus Prime aired. It's over, Prime. Never! Hang on, Autobots, it's not over. Optimus Prime returns February 24th and 25th on The Transformers. In this extended episode, Rodimus Prime has to resurrect Optimus Prime to stop a plague that could wipe out humans and Transformers. Kids like me were happy to see the backbone of the show we loved back on our living room screens. They probably could have rebranded him as Optimus Prime Classic. Check out my episode all about the disaster of New Coke for more details on that one. But now Hasbro had another unforeseen problem on their hands. With the renewed interest in Optimus Prime, there was nothing on shelves. With this movie, everything old was to be cleared out after all. The renewed interest in the beloved character forced Hasbro to bring the toy back. But since that was never in the plans, re-releasing the toy couldn't exactly happen overnight. There wouldn't be any new Optimus Primes on shelves until 1988. Unfortunately, Hasbro dodged a bullet with the backlash to Transformers the movie. The return of Optimus Prime in the TV series kept fans happy and continued their investment in the franchise. This kept the toy line going well into the 90s. The first generation cartoon finished in 1987, but a new series called Transformers Generation 2 was released in 1992. But the lesson was learned. Optimus Prime wasn't going anywhere and would forever be the backbone of this franchise. Hasbro also had to backtrack on its plan with a G.I. Joe feature film that was being produced at the same time as the Transformers movie. The G.I. Joe movie was also going to feature the death of a major character, that being Duke. But after seeing the backlash from the Transformers movie, Hasbro made a quick change. That film wasn't released in theaters, went straight to video, and the death of Duke was turned into a coma instead. Despite the poor box office results, one place where the movie performed well was in the growing new area of home video. In 1987, Transformers the movie was released on VHS, and it couldn't have come at a better time. If you go back and listen to my previous episodes about the golden age of video stores and my episode on Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future, the second half of the 80s is when many toy companies discovered how lucrative home video could be. 
In the first half of the decade, both movies and VCRs were incredibly expensive. Now, with everything coming down in price, families were more likely to own a VCR and buy movies to keep their kids entertained. Instead of Disney movies dominating the shelves, they were now filled with VHS tapes of things we saw on Saturday mornings or after school. Strawberry Shortcake, Captain Power, Barbie and the Rockers, Teddy Ruxpin, and now the Transformers the movie filled sale and rental shelves. Sales of the Transformers VHS movie were extremely good as it stayed in the top 25 movies for an astounding 40 weeks. Fun fact, the very famous expletive spoken by Spike Witwicky in the movie was cut from the home video version as a way to get this back to its after-school cartoon roots. Optimus Prime still dies though. To this day, Transformers content continues to be a part of our modern entertainment. But it's bizarre to think how it could have possibly come to an end back in 1986. It clearly didn't, and multiple toy lines, cartoons, and feature films continued to be made over the coming decades, and to this day. Back in 86, the toy line and cartoon were only a few years old. There wasn't a legacy yet. There weren't decades of fandom built up. For all anyone knew, Transformers wouldn't last beyond the 80s, and that still would have been a pretty good run. I'm sure everyone involved back then would have never predicted that we'd be here today still discussing it nearly 40 years later, and there's still movies being released. Despite the commerce-driven reasons, the Transformers the movie is an astonishing piece of work, even more so today if you can see it in a modern and remastered 4K presentation. Considering the limitations and requirements, the writers and creators did an amazing job. The storytelling could only go in specific directions based on the removal and introduction of new characters. The animation is astonishing, as is the sound design, especially when you consider this movie is getting closer to 40 years old. The voice talent is nothing less than a true superstar lineup. Yes, the music dates it, but that also helps it capture a unique period in time. Because of the soundtrack, there is no mistaking when this movie came out. We have to remember that, at the time, this is what the hottest music sounded like, so why wouldn't you include it in a movie directed at kids? Transformers the movie went on to become a cult classic and has now become much more appreciated. Despite the various reactions to the Transformers the movie, there is no doubt that this film made a significant impact. So that's our show. Thank you so much for listening. If you like what you heard, you know there's plenty more where that came from. For further listening, I mentioned my episodes on the history of Transformers, video stores, Captain Power, and even New Coke. But there are plenty more great episodes for you to dive back into. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts for more beloved 1980s content. If you're in a position to help the show, you can consider becoming a part of Patreon.com. That's the platform to get access to bonus audio content. If you want to learn more, just head to Patreon.com slash 80s. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash 80s or click on the link in the description. So that's it for me. I'm Jamie. This has been Everything 80s, but I'll be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.